Now I want to uh, jump into our message for tonight, and the question to kick things off is, do you enjoy being told what to do? Do you like being told what to do? How many of you are like, no way? How many of you are like, actually, I don't know what I'm doing, and I need somebody to tell me what to do? If we're honest, it's a mix, because we don't like people telling us what to do if they don't have our best intention in mind, but most of us are desperate for wisdom. And most of you, while you're young, you say, I really want older, wiser people to steer me in the right direction. And I need people who know more than I know. And so many of you are hungry for mentors. You're hungry for truth. You're hungry for direction in life. And you actually want to be told what to do. Well, I've got good news for you. Jesus told us what to do. He gave us an assignment. He gave us our marching orders. And so our text for tonight is coming from Matthew chapter 28. Verses 18 through 20. And here's my big assumption jumping in. Is that knowing Jesus is more precious than anything else in life. Knowing Jesus is more precious than career or marriage or sex or money or fame or influence or reputation. Knowing Jesus matters for all eternity. It's more precious than anything in life. And when we know Jesus... He gives us a task. We call it the Great Commission. He asks us to follow Him and then asks us to give our lives to helping other people follow Him. He calls it the Great Commission. So here's the big idea. I'll give it away from the beginning. I want you to make disciples. Don't stop. Start now and do it for the rest of your life. Make disciples. Don't stop. Start now in college and do it till you die. So Matthew 28, here's what Jesus says. This is His last words before leaving earth. Last recorded statement of Jesus, His orders to us, instructions. He says, Then Jesus came to His disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. To pick it apart real quick, here's Jesus. And Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. So some of you have fear at doing ministry. Fear at telling others about Jesus. Fear at what people will think, maybe fear of, maybe some of you will go home to a country because you're not from this country where it's illegal to tell people about Jesus. But here's what Jesus says. Those countries don't have authority, ultimately. Your fear doesn't have authority, ultimately. Politically correct culture doesn't have authority, ultimately. Jesus has all authority, and he says go. All authority has been given to him. So he says, and these are commands, go and make disciples. Although one of the interesting facts about that word go in verse 19 is go is not actually a command. If you've translated it literally, it would say, therefore, going, make disciples. And so some people have asked, does that mean that we're all told to go, like to another location, to go go cross-culturally, to go to another place and make disciples? Or does it mean as we go, as you're going, as you go about your life, go about your business, make disciples? Which is it? Go or as you're going about your business? And the answer is yes. It's both. It has both senses to it. It's part of the command to make disciples But it's also, it's not just for the ones who are sent, it's for every person to go and to make disciples, not just of your people, but all people. Not just of our nation, but all nations. One of the reasons I love UTA, I think one of the points on a slide in a minute, if Tate wants to put it up, is there's no better task than the Great Commission, and there's no better place to make disciples than the college campus. Because the nations of the world, don't you know it? 
You just look in your classes, you look across our campus, the nations of the world are right here. And we can fulfill the Great Commission right here. And so I think there's no better task than this, and there's no better place to do it than the college campus, than this college campus. There's no better time to do it than now, and there's no better opportunity than by being part of a fellowship committed to making disciples. So Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey. That means grow continually. You never get there. You're always learning. You're always growing spiritually. And Jesus says, I'm with you always. Some of you are Christians, but you feel stagnant in your faith. Some of you have grown up in church, and you've been through the motions, and you've done it all before, and you don't feel near to Jesus. But Jesus says, when you're with Him in the Great Commission, then He is with you in intimacy. He's with you in a unique and special way. So some of you say, I just want to know how to feel near to God and how to grow spiritually. Let's do this. Because Jesus says, when we do this, He's with us. It's so beautiful. So I got four points I want to share with you before we get cut out of here. About the Great Commission, point number one, Jesus' strategy is to build His kingdom by multiplying disciples. His strategy to reach this world of seven and a half billion people is by multiplying disciples. So let's unpack this. Who did Jesus give His Great Commission to? To His disciples. And He tells His disciples to go and make disciples. So I want you to see the cycle. So over here, there's 12 of them. Actually, there's a few hundred of them. Not a lot, but 72 at one point, a few hundred at another point. And he tells his disciples to go out there in a world who doesn't know him, share the gospel with people, teach those people how to be in the word of God, how to pray, how to share with others, how to abide in Christ. And as you do that, you make them into disciples. Now all of a sudden... There were this many disciples, now there's this many disciples. And they all of a sudden are back at the beginning of the equation as disciples who are told by Jesus to start making more disciples. Not go and preach to huge crowds, just a few of you, but every disciple go and make disciples. Each one of you make one or two. And then that one or two can make four or eight. And that 4 or 8 can make 16 or 64, and it multiplies. Jesus started that plan, and today, 2.5 billion people on earth claim the name of Jesus. Because He started it with 12, and it's continued to every person in this room. And He asks us to pass it on. So His strategy is to multiply disciples. Uh, a mentor through books of mine. His name is Dawson Trotman. Dawson Trotman wrote a book called Born to Reproduce. And his premise is that every living thing, and you biology majors know this, it's coded in our genes. We're driven to reproduce. It's why in the spring you look for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's why, it's, it's why the flowers make beautiful flowers so they can spread their pollen because living things are made to produce more of themselves. And every Christian is a living thing and has the Spirit of God living in them. And God wants you, if you're a Christian, to reproduce other Christians. You know how you tell if a living thing is mature? How do they, how do they talk about it? Some things like gone through adolescence and reached maturity. It's if that thing is, is reached the ability to reproduce itself. Some Christians live their whole lives and never invest in other people and never reproduce the, the life of Christ in them and other people. And the way you tell if you're a mature Christian is if you're sharing Jesus, His love with other people, and if you're serving other people, and if you're encouraging believers to be strong in the faith, you're a mature Christian because you're making disciples. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. It's a verse that points this out. So this is Paul telling a younger pastor, Timothy, So my son, be strong in the grace that's in Jesus Christ, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people 
who are also qualified to teach others also. I call this 4G. You know your phone has 4G? This is 4G discipleship. Paul tells Timothy, he said, look, you've heard me teach you some things. So Paul's 1G, Timothy's the second generation. He's taught Timothy, the things you've heard me say, teach to some reliable people. Reliable men who are then able, 3rd G, to teach others also, 4th generation disciples. Some of you are like, that sounds well and good, but how, what does that actually look like? Let me tell you a story. A bunch of years ago, we had a sweet girl who came to this Bible study named Crystal, and Crystal lived in Lipscomb. And she said, there's not a Bible study in Lipscomb, but there's a lot of lost people in Lipscomb who don't come to this Bible study. Can I start a Bible study? I'm like, Jesus told you to do it. You don't have to ask me to do it. Go do it. So she started a Lipscomb Bible study, which... And people came, and people who wouldn't have been in church or in Bible study came to it because she just kind of lived an open life, and she invited the girls. And the, it was when there was a half that was girls and half that was boys, so she invited girls to it, and eventually it became boys too. Um, and she did that. Well, eventually, about the time she was graduating, another guy who was involved here named Andy, who grew up in South Arlington, took it over. And so she kind of passed the baton to him, and Andy invited people to Bible study. He shared his life with non-Christians and shared Jesus with non-Christians. He invited a few believers to be part of the Bible study with him and help lead it. He started bringing people to church. He started bringing people to campus ministry. And he, and he made some disciples. One of the guys he reached was a guy who grew up in Austin who moved into Lipscomb named Jared. And Andy shared with Jared, we could reach Lipscomb. And so Andy graduated and Jared stayed at Lipscomb and shared Jesus with people and encouraged believers. One of the people he shared Jesus with was Pudi, who was an atheist, who took a, after a year of believers in Lipscomb sharing with her, met Christ. Andy eventually graduated, and Pudi started leading Lipscomb. Pudi kept leading Lipscomb, eventually shared with non-Christians, shared with believers, people met Jesus, believers got strengthened. She influenced a ton of people. One of the people she influenced and passed it on to was Jacqueline. Jacqueline led it as a student, moved on to our staff. Eventually, in Lipscomb, had been impacted by the people Jacqueline impacted. And next year, you're going to impact people because you've been impacted. That's eight generations. Next year, nine generations of disciples. And that's one story out of dozens of stories. Imagine that effect multiplied by every person in this room over the next 50 years of your life. And imagine the effect on this world. Let's keep going. Point two. Making disciples requires being a disciple. You can't make people into what you're not. So you have to be a disciple to, be a, to make a disciple. It's not complicated to follow Jesus. It's not complicated to be a disciple of Jesus. It's actually pretty simple. You turn from sin and follow Him. You grow in Him. You grow by spending time in His Word and time in prayer. You grow by spending time in Christian fellowship and sharing Jesus with others. It's just a few simple things. And if you do those things, you don't need a seminary degree. You don't need to know Greek or Hebrew. You don't need a bunch of theology. You just need to follow Jesus faithfully and you'll be a disciple. So it's not complicated. It's simple. But it's not easy. It'll cost you your life. One of the things Jesus says in Luke 9.23, what is a disciple anyway? I guess we ought to know what it is if we're going to make one. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple, it's simple. All you got to do is deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That word follow me is literally be a disciple. So he says, if you want to be a disciple, you've got to be a disciple. After me. The word disciple literally means a follower. It means somebody who follows along behind. And the word picture that is brought to mind is somebody who follows behind in the same footprints. Like step by step. In the same steps. And so the picture is almost like if you walk in snow and you make a footprint 
and you make another footprint and somebody comes along behind you and instead of messing up the snow, they like follow right in behind you exactly the way you walk. And Jesus says, the way I've lived, loving others, sharing good news, do that. Walk the way I walk. Whenever my kids were little, they would walk so close behind me sometimes that I'd throw on the brakes, right? And they'd slam into the back. And then little brother would walk behind big brother. And little brother, big brother would throw on the brakes and little brother would run into the back of him. And that's how Jesus wants to follow him. Closely in his same steps. It's what he asks of us. There's a paradoxical truth, however, that says if we give our life to Jesus then He gives His life to us. And we say the cost is too high. And I'm not willing to give my mortal 60, 70, 80, whatever years you get on earth. I, I, I don't know if I'm willing to give up my mortal life on earth, but Jesus has earned eternal life. The only human being, fully God, but fully human being to conquer death. And Jesus says if we'll follow Him and give Him our lives, He'll give us His life. And so there's no better place to be than lockstep following Jesus wholeheartedly. That's what a disciple is. So yes, go out, have a great life. Following Jesus doesn't mean you have to give up career aspirations. You can still have a great career. It doesn't mean give up, have a family. Have a family. Buy a house. Have a job. Have fun with life. But filter every decision you make through what would Jesus have me do. And the life He wants to give you is so much sweeter so much better than what this world would offer you as an alternative. So being a disciple, re making disciples requires being a disciple. Third point, making disciples is for every Christian, not just select Christians. Um, how many of y'all in this room, uh, how, how many of you feel like kind of a special call to ministry? Like I'm called to ministry I'm called to be a missionary. Anybody in the room kind of like, that's my, I, I feel that call. There's a few, I know a few of you who've told me that before. Okay. Wrong. How many of in this room would say, I'm a Christian? Raise your hand. Okay, now leave your hands up. Now how many of you feel a call to ministry? Leave your hands up. It should be the same answer. So let me, let's do a little, uh, do a little, uh, little history lesson here. In the early church, there was a notion that ordinary Christians were the ones who did the work of ministry. There were no paid ministers. There were, there were a few who made their living that way, but by and large, we tend to think that the apostles were the ones that did everything. The apostles equipped the saints for works of service, and the saints reached people for the gospel. At the, in Pentecost, when the church was born, it says that there were 3,000 people converted that day who became Christians, and they were from all over the world because they were in the city that day for a festival, and then they went back all over the world, and most of the time when the Apostle Paul, the great missionary who supposedly started all the churches, most of the time when he went to a new city to do ministry, there was already a church there because an ordinary Christian had shared Jesus with their family, and then that family had shared Jesus with their neighbors, and those neighbors had shared Jesus with more neighbors, and the church spread like wildfire because ordinary Christians took up the work of ministry. Then the Roman Empire, because Christianity became so ascendant, the, the empire realized the power that Christianity had among the masses, and eventually the Roman Empire becomes Christianized, and the ministry becomes professionalized. And the Catholic Church had a doctrine that said that only certain people are priests. And other ordinary Christians don't have the same kind of access to God and can't do the same kind of ministry. But First Peter tells us that every Christian is part of a royal priesthood. Every Christian is part of God's holy nation. Every Christian is an ambassador for Christ. Have y'all ever wondered why there's a Baptist church on like every corner in every small town, everywhere you go in Texas? It's kind of weird, right? Like the, it's not like that with most other churches. There's Baptist churches everywhere. There's Methodist churches everywhere. 
And that's about it. There's Churches of Christ, which were Baptist churches that changed their name because they, they changed a couple little doctrines and changed their name, but they were spread by Baptists. Have you ever wondered why Southern Baptists are like the biggest denomination? And I know a lot of y'all aren't Baptists, but I'm going to tell a story because a lot of you are secret Baptists and you think you go to a Bible church, but that's actually a Baptist church. Some of you think you go to a community church, but that's actually a Baptist church. And some of you say, I don't, yeah, whatever. Some of you go, some of you go to a non-denominational church, but it's actually, this is off topic, but if your church dunks people in water to baptize them, bad news, you're a Baptist. So, <laughs> by heritage, if not by like denominational affiliation. Have you ever wondered why there's bad, those kinds of churches, like that's the ascendant church worldwide, Pentecostal, charismatic, they all fall in that tradition is because Baptists said you don't have to have seminary training in the early days of our country. You don't have to have some kind of special ordination or call. You can be a farmer and be a preacher and start a church. And they took ordinary people who sat at the feet of saintly people and they dispersed across our country and every tiny town could have a church because every believer in that kind of church could start a new church. And so the little town I grew up in had 800 people and there were three Baptist churches around it. 800 people. But the whole town had access to the gospel. What if we reclaim the DNA of the early church and we said not professional people, but every person is a minister of God. American Christianity has gotten, is full of fat people. Spiritually fat people. You know what I mean by that? We eat and eat and eat and eat and we consume and consume and we treat, we love Christian celebrities because they can do ministry really, really well and we love comfortable churches because I can sit back and be ministered to. And I want a church where I can be fed and I want a church where the worship is good and I want a church where the preaching's good. And we turn church into consumerism and the power of the DNA of the Great Commission is that every one of us can be a minister of the gospel. Um, one of the things I like to do is do a little math equation. If, um, if you ask me, Gary, what would it take to reach the world with the gospel? then I would say right here in Arlington, we have the biggest, best stadium in the world. AT&T Stadium. What do they call it? The Jerry World. Whatever it's called. It's, so there it is. 105,000 people can fit in there. And here's what I'd say. We need to get the best bands and the best speaker and we need to publicize it all over like Greg Laurie does the Harvest Crusade and pack it out with people to hear about Jesus and we get the very best of the best of the best to share Jesus with them. And say we did that and 100,000 people came and 20,000 people on a good Monday night met Jesus. Would that be a good night? 20,000 people meet Jesus. It's making sense to me. And what if we could just repeat it the next night and we could have part two, new 100,000 people, new 20,000 people. At this point, the news media is saying, hey, Two nights in a row, 100,000 people, 20,000 met it. And then three nights, four nights, five nights, all of a sudden 100,000 people have met Jesus and it's Friday. And then we say, let's take it on the road. We go to Fort Worth Convention Center, Saturday night, 20,000 believers. Sunday night, we go to American Airlines, another 20,000 believers, and we say, let's take it on the road. And we go to Austin. We go to San Antonio. We go to Houston. We we. Texas, 20,000 people a night. Now the national news is picking it up and it's revival and everybody's calling it revival and the world's on fire with revival. And then we go state to state and then we take it international and every night for 365 nights, 20,000 people meet Jesus. A stadium full of people meet Jesus every night for a year. Would that be powerful? That would be 1.7 million people meeting Jesus in a year. And the world would have grown by 87 million people in the same year. Would have never kept pace. But say I was the only Christian on earth. I was the only one on earth. And tomorrow I started spending time with Sebastian. And I started sharing the good news with him. And I started sharing my the love of God with him. And after six months, Sebastian commits his life to Jesus. It's kind of a cool story because it really happened um, with Ben and Sebastian. 
But after six months, I win Sebastian to Christ. And I don't move on. I spend six more months teaching Sebastian to feed himself spiritually and spend time in God's Word and how to pray and how to share this good news with other people. At the end of a year, there'd be two. But in the stadium plan, there'd be 1.7 million. But at the end of that year, Sebastian and I, we each start sharing with a new person. Six months later, we've won two more people. And a year later, there's four disciples. But there's 3.4 million in the stadium plan. Y'all following? Year three, Sebastian and my movement has eight people in it. Year four, it has 16 people. In year 33... It has 9 billion people, more than every man, woman, and child on earth. So you tell me whose plan's better. Our plan, Christian celebrities, stadiums, or ordinary Christians go into their classes, get actually introducing yourself to your neighbor instead of being on your phone, and inviting them to a Bible study, inviting them to eat lunch, asking them about their spiritual background, and slowly over time sharing Jesus with the people in your life. And finding young believers and inviting them to Bible study and inviting them to pray with you and building them up into disciples. And if we did that, if every Christian did that, the world could be reached in less than our lifetime. Tell you a few stories to close. Uh, We've had graduates every year for the last several years who graduate and decide to give one year up in ministry service. Some have moved overseas. In fact, we have a whole team of our graduates that live in East Asia running a campus ministry in East Asia. The discipleship movement that God started here is over there now. Uh, Just last year, we sent two of our people to Tyler, Texas. Um, Reagan to run a campus ministry at Tyler Junior College, Amber to work at uh, UT Tyler. They've both seen people come to Jesus this semester because of the discipleship movement that started here carried on there. Some of y'all, I hope that when you graduate, you'll give up one or two years before you move into your career to take what you've learned here to wherever you go next. John and Catherine are two of our alumni. I, I talked to them on the phone yesterday. Or, uh, and we, uh, uh, John and Catherine, are, he's, John's an engineer. Catherine's a nurse. They're dinks, dual income, no kids. Engineers and nurses, they do all right. Um, you know, they do like buy a nice house, buy two cars, go, to your, go on fancy vacations to Europe, kind of like salary because they don't have kids and can kind of do what they want. John and Catherine last month moved into Ladera Palms apartment in Fort Worth, which is a refugee resettlement community. With their two income, can do whatever we want, could buy a big house kind of money so they could share the love of Jesus with refugees. And so they want to give their their early married years before they have kids to that ministry. They also joined Caitlin and Josh who had already moved into Ladera Palm so they could share their life with refugees, mostly Muslims who need to meet Jesus. Maybe for you, following Jesus will look like that. You get a job, but you choose carefully where you live for the sake of influencing others. David Soward graduated two years ago moved to Utah to do a PhD. He got discipleship here. He learned how to share the gospel here. He's been sharing the gospel in Mormon country for two years and seeing God do some cool stuff. Maybe that's you. Ricky and Emily both graduated and served on our staff as interns and then went and are teaching school in Arlington. But they're serving in their church and for a long time before the baby came, they were, they were helping lead a Sunday night church for Chinese restaurant workers who worked all day Sunday, seven days a week, and late at night on Sunday when they get off work, a a group of believers would go and share Jesus with them and help them have church late at night. And so maybe that's what it looks like for you, just saying, I'm going to live on mission now, but I'm also going to live on mission when I graduate. Ricky, Rachel, Mario, Tisha, and Ernesto all sat in this room, all graduated, all got jobs in Fort Worth, were all friends, all serving in their local church, And then they realized there was a neighborhood near them, an impoverished neighborhood that did not have an evangelical church. And they said, why don't we start one? And they're two years into a church plant on the north side of Fort Worth, in a school, bivocational, earning their living, but instead of Sunday morning being a consumer, they're ministering to their neighborhood. Maybe that could be you. What if ordinary Christians 
took Jesus at his word and obeyed the Great Commission could change the world. So here's my last point. Start now. Don't wait till you graduate. Don't wait until you think I've got all the answers and I got everything figured out. If you think I need to know so much Bible or I need to get so much of my life together before I start serving God, you'll never get there. Start now. Get rid of sin, sure. Spend time in God's Word to grow, sure. But start inviting people to your church. Start sharing, opening your life up to people and just introducing yourself and looking for opportunities to share Jesus. Start now. But do it for the rest of your life. There's no better task to give your life to than the Great Commission. There's no better place to do it than the college campus. I think it's the most strategic mission field in the world. No better time to start and no better opportunity than to do it alongside a group like this. You know, we're all in it together, right? We're all, we're all Mavs. We're all here on this campus together. We, we, we love Jesus. Why wouldn't we bond together and try to reach UTA together? And then take what we learn with us for the rest of our life. So, kind of to close, I do want to talk, I, I do want to encourage you to consider joining our leadership team. You can make disciples without joining the BSM team. But what joining the BSM team does is it gives you partners to do it with. Don't do it alone. Let us help you. Um, so consider joining the team. If you're graduating, join a church. Serve that church, but make disciples. Build your life, have a career, but for the rest of your life, invest in other people. God will change the world if we'll be faithful and obey and do that. So uh, we're a little late on time, so I'm just going to pray to close us and dismiss you to small groups. Grab an application over there if you want one. Leaders, current BSM leaders, if you'll fill out a yellow re-up card, tell us if you're going to serve next year, that'd be awesome. It's also a summer leadership, that's the orange slip, grab that. Love you guys. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm going to dismiss you to small groups to talk about all this. Let's pray. Father, you are good, great, unimaginably great. God, whatever our minds can conceive, you're better than that. None of us deserves eternal salvation. None of us deserves to see you face to face, unhindered by our own sin, unhindered by our weakness. But Jesus, because you paid that infinite debt on the cross, because you took our place, dying on the cross for our sins, you've offered eternal life. And God, those of us who've received it, we say it is unimaginably good. So God, I pray we'd be faithful to obey not the great suggestion, but your great commission. God, there is no better task to give our lives to than that. I pray that movements that have started in this room would touch the world and that people sitting in these chairs right now would impact eternity. Please, Jesus. If anybody in this room doesn't know you yet, I pray that they would surrender to you because there's no sweeter life than in you, Jesus. Well, I said all in your name. Amen. So bless you guys. You're dismissed to groups. We'll see you in the library mall next week. I can't wait.